Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. It's our weekly Q&A show where you get to ask the questions and we get to answer them. Keep them tech related and fire them into the email address on the screen there. And of course you can add them in the comments below. Just make sure you use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech, both in the comments and on the email address so we can find them nice and easy. So all sorts of questions this week. First one actually, and I forgive me if I got this wrong, but I hope I've pronounced this right, um, from Shah Dupang. Hopefully I've got your name right. Um, so I have a stupid question to ask. Basically, I have a Yeti SB66C frame, very nice bike, um, and I wanna change my bottom bracket, but I found out there's quite a lot of things on the market, BB90, GXP stuff, etc. Can you help me out? Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, by the way, I wanna replace it with a SRAM XX1 crank. Okay, so the SB66 frame, as far as I know, is threaded. Um, there's various different iterations of the bike over the years, so hopefully it is just a threaded bottom bracket. I know it has a splined interface for the ISCG mount on there, but being a threaded BB means you're not really limited in what you put into that frame. So if I was you and you wanna run a SRAM frame, I'd take the advantage of the new SRAM dub system. So you buy a set of SRAM cranks to go on there and they come with that new dub bottom bracket that will fit your frame. Of course, there's lots of different levels from NX all the way up to XX1 there. So make sure you check them out to get the right option for your particular bike. But I think that's gonna suit you and I think that will work nicely. It's kind of future-proofed as well. Next up is from Scott RC. Um, how come bike manufacturers don't use dual disc brakes up front, like on motorbikes? Maybe it would be beneficial on downhill bikes. Well, it has been done before a long time ago, so the shot on the screen now is of the Cullimore Engineering dual front disc brake. Now, simply put, it just wasn't needed at the time. You know, brakes were getting quite good, and on a mountain bike, really sort of power to weight ratio, it's arguable whether you actually need that much power. Of course, bikes are changing though, and especially e-bikes and heavier bikes could well take advantage of that. But you've got to think that there's different factors that go in. Like on a big heavy bike, like on a motorbike, you can get some sort of twist and flex when you're braking that can translate into what you can feel on the bars. It's kind of similar, I guess, to torque steer in a car. So if you've got your engine mounted um, traversely at the front there, you're going to have those little half shafts rather than full length prop shafts or drive shafts. Uh, one will always be slightly shorter than the other, so the amount they flex is going to be different. So if you're a really powerful car, uh, you're going to be able to put your foot down and the car will want to just pull slightly to one side. So I guess it's a similar principle to that with motorbikes, you know, while they have those dual discs on the racing bikes, especially like the GP bikes, because they can put an immense amount of power down and there's no flex, no distortion, nothing's gonna happen. But as a downside, there's only so much power you can put through to the front wheel before you will lose traction. And of course, it's about modulation and balancing out that power, and that's what they do really well on those bikes. And I just don't think it's ne necessarily needed on mountain bikes yet. We've got huge disc rotors. I don't think there's gonna be a huge advantage to it. Um, you certainly don't need any more braking power, but perhaps the way you can manage the braking forces and you could sort of, you know, it's gonna help the, the pads deal with heat better because you're spreading that load out across them. I just think it's an unnecessary sort of weight at the time being, but it has been done before and they, they look very cool, but I did hear that there were problems with leakages and at the end of the day, it just wasn't really needed. All right, next up is from baron one c Jezza 191 Hi Doddy, I'm just getting back into mountain biking and I bought myself an entry level GT hardtail. It's 27 and a half plus. Boost hubs, two by nine setup. Um, two problems I need to remedy. The first one, when in my lowest gears, my chain rubs on the tires. Uh, this could be my cheap Suntor crank not being boost compatible. Second, my chain bounces way too much. My rear derailleur, Shimano Altus, seems like it doesn't have enough tension. I want to upgrade to Shimano SLX 11 speed, but keep nine speed cassette shifter for now. Can I just use the limit screws to keep it nine speed or should I get a deal? Uh, nine-speed rear derailleur. Thanks so much. Okay, well the first one is a bit of a bit of a mystery to me. If it's a new bike, then there should be no issues because that bike is designed for that size wheel. So really, it shouldn't be rubbing on the chain at all. Um, is your bike by any chance quick release rear? So if it is, there's a slight chance that when you put the wheel in or when someone else has put the wheel in, it's just not quite sat into the dropouts correctly. So I've seen this on bikes in the past and is a chance that it's just moved to one side. So just double check that. Um, and if not, there is also a slim chance that perhaps your rear wheel hasn't been dished correctly. Now dishing is something that's done to wheels in order to centralize the 
the rim over the hub. And of course, on the back wheel, it's going to be off center. So that's basically it's referring to the dish of the wheel because the rim has to effectively sit over one set of flanges in order to fit the cassette and all your gears on there. So you'll see that, you know, the spokes on one side will be braced over quite an angle and in the middle, they're going to be quite straight. Now that process is known as dishing. And if, for example, it hasn't been done quite enough or it's been done too much, the wheel itself will sit either closer to your non-drive side chainstay or your drive side chainstay. So that is another chance that has happened to yours. And of course, there is one more issue. It could be perhaps in installation on a production line, the bottom bracket itself was perhaps too short and it was just fitted incorrectly or fitted because it was the incorrect part. I've actually had that with a bike I owned years ago and it's fitted with the wrong bottom bracket just by mistake on a production line. You know, they have a big sort of tub of different bottom brackets as they fit them in, machine fit them in, um, and one was just the wrong one in the tub, um, just part of that. And as a result, my chain rings were actually stuck on the frame and the crank wouldn't even go around. So that had to go back straight away. So it does, does go to show that that stuff can happen. But um, I can't think of any other reason why your chain would be rubbing. Um, if the derailleur was rubbing on the on the tire itself, that's down to adjustment, but the chain is like it shouldn't be rubbing on there at all. Now, as for chain bounce, unfortunately, yeah, with a more budget and wallet conscious derailleurs, they're gonna have a little less chain tension on them and they don't always have a clutch mechanism on them. So the DL1 is fine, but you could use that SLX and use the limit screws. That would be fine. It's only when you're trying to add more gears to a derailleur that you get the problems because of the limits. So you can screw it in. Um, might be have to screw it in quite a way in order to get your gears perfect, but it should be okay on there as provided you keep the original shifter chain and cassette set up on there. Um, so hopefully that will work out for you. And next up is from Alex Lefevre. Um, How do you feel about a DIY semi-slick tire? I love them. Nice and simple. Um, I've done this loads in the past. If there's been perhaps a tire where I feel like the center knobs are a little bit high and squirm around, it's quite good to clip them down. Uh, it's also a really good way of getting more out of an old worn tire where the tire on a central tread actually sort of wears down. You'll find your shoulders probably won't be too bad. So it's worth clipping them down so you get nice fresh sharp edges on them, but make the most of a low rolling resistance. I think it's a quite a cool thing to do. And of course, if you can speed up your bike in the process, it's not a bad thing. Okay, so we've got another unlucky bottom bracket sounding problem here from Utratopo. Um, hi Dolly, please help. I've bought a brand new Specialized Fuse. Very cool hardtail bike that. Um, I use it mostly to ride on logging roads. No Blake craziness, although I wish I could. I think we all wish that, don't we? Um, after less than 300 miles, uh, the bottom bracket started creaking. So the bike shop where I bought it replaced it. Then three miles after, the new bottom bracket not only started creaking again, but now the chain ring is rubbing on the chain stay and it's scraped off the paint where you can see the metal. That is not good, dude. Um, I feel the frame has got more flex since the initial bottom bracket problem. Would you recommend I do? All right, let's just take that in reverse slightly there. So you say about the frame having more flex. Um, I don't think it's a frame unless you're really unlucky enough to have cracked that frame around the chain stays, for example, and you feel that flex. What I think might be the problem actually, so I, I had to have a look on the site and I'll see there's several different models in the fuse and some of them have got threaded with GXP bottom brackets on there. And I noticed that some of the more budget ones have got square tapered um, bottom brackets on them, which is, uh, they're fine, they work really well when they're set up, but they can suffer from problems. And if your bike is one that's got a square taper crank, that is where the problem will be, and that is where that flex that I think you're feeling could also be. So a square tapered bottom bracket quite simply has a square tapered axle on the end of it, and on the crank, which will be made of typically aluminium, it will have a square taper to match that, and it sits on, obviously it can't go any further than that taper, and then you tighten up, it can be an eight millimeter or it can be, I think, a 14 millimeter bolt um, rather than an Allen key head bolt in there. Now, one of the problems you have is they work really well when the contact is clean and it's a good fit. If it's ridden even a tiny bit loose, I mean that, that crank, whether it's a left or a right, what happens is the opening to that crank in the softer aluminum from the chromoly axle will slightly stretch and you'll get it, it'll start creeping around and that will turn into creaking. Now, it doesn't matter how many times you change that bottom bracket, the crank will be the problem, not the bottom bracket. So you definitely want to check that your crank isn't damaged. And if there's any doubt, get the bike shop to try it with a fresh crank. 
and you will soon see what the problem may or may not be. If it's the actual bottom bracket itself, you might just be extremely unlucky. Again, it does happen. Um, you know, manufacturing processes, you know, you can think how many things go through a manufacturer, you know, in a factory, you're gonna get stuff like that. But I think it might be that square taper. Now there's also a few rules if you chose to do this yourself rather than the bike shop. Square tapers, I think most people will tell you that you should set them up dry. So it should be clean, degreased, it's a dry fit, uh, the crank onto the axle and then you tighten that bolt. You might want to put some grease on the threads of the bolt that you tighten up into the end of the axle because if you actually grease that square taper, I mean some people say to use grease, personally I I don't think that's the best idea because if you manage to over tighten that crank, which the grease can enable because it can still slide slightly, you're going to stretch the crank and you're going to be back to that problem of the crank having that minute amount of movement in it. I guess you could use something like an assembly compound, which has floating particles in it, like a carbon gripper to help stop that movement. But if it's not tightened on sufficiently because of that compound, you're going to get that creaking again. So I really hope that your problem is the fact the crank is damaged because that's a cheap and easy problem to fix. But my advice would be, if that is your problem, maybe save up some pennies and further down the line, when you do some upgrades, change your bottom bracket and your cranks for something none tapered. Okay, next up is from your boy Ben. Uh, I've got a creaky noise coming from my back brake. Any ideas what it could be? By the way, I took the pads out to give them a clean, but it's still creaking. Okay, I guess so, process of elimination with any creak. So firstly, you wanna check the caliper bolts, and if you've got any of those little shims on there, the little cone washers, make sure they're all clean, they haven't got sort of grit and stuff that's gonna enable them to creak if there's any minute movement in there. Next up, you wanna check that the bolts themselves have got some thread lock on, so once they're in, they stay in. And also, you wanna check if the adapter itself is loose or has any movement or dirt that can create movement, even if the bolts are fairly tight. So you get different types, you get the post mount ones, you get international standard, whatever it is, take them off, clean them all, put some fresh thread lock on, again, emphasize the clean point, put it back together. And if that's not your problem, then it might just be your disc rotor itself. So a disc rotor can, with a slight bit of movement, creak when it's on the hub. So make sure all the bolts are tight, make sure you've got all of the bolts on there to start with. And finally, make sure you check your wheel axle, whether it's a quick release or a bolt through or whatever sort of system you have, because basically creaking comes from movement. We know that. So if there's no movement anywhere, in theory, you shouldn't have any creaking. Um, and I'm assuming that you definitely know it's coming from the back of the bike, judging by the way you've said you've taken out the pads, but it could be coming from the lever as well. So, but I guess you would feel that with your hand if it was, uh, but nonetheless worth checking. Um, I don't know of any other sort of issues that could creak around a rear brake. So um, hopefully that's the answer. Uh, good luck with that. Okay, last one for this week actually raises quite a serious safety point. So I'm gonna read this whole question. It's quite shocking actually. So this is from Ryan Garcia. Hi Doddy, I recently got into a rough crash and my handlebar impaled my leg. It went deep enough that the brake lever also impaled me and it ended up doing the worst bit of damage um, and I ended up with a hole three and a half inches deep and four inches wide. I was within half an inch of my femoral, uh, or femoral uh, artery and if it hit it I could have died because it takes roughly a minute to bleed out uh, and I was 40 minutes from the hospital the medics took about 10 minutes to arrive. Um, the bike I have is a 2018 Rocky Mountain Maiden just with the stock grips. And I was wondering if there are any grips out there that would help prevent another situation like this. Um, and I'd also like to know of any padding that could protect my inner thigh. Um, now, first up, I'm, I don't really know of any padding. I know there's quite a few sort of um, short liners you get with padding, but it doesn't tend to have it on the inside of the thigh for obvious reasons they're designed for cycling in. So if any viewers out there know of anything, please let us know in those comments because it would be good to know from a safety point of view uh, to see if we can help Ryan. Um, but more importantly, the bar end, the whole core sample thing is quite a serious thing. Now there was a story recently of a, a young rider in the UK that unfortunately isn't as lucky as you Ryan. And it's, um, I don't need to spell it out, but it's drawn more safety awareness to it. Now I'm putting a link in the description below this video to a story on Cycle Industry News. There's actually a petition in there to change basically safety on kids bikes, to make sure that all kids bikes, regardless of the handlebar grip, have a proper bar end plug installed in the handlebar underneath. 
So when the kids no doubt drop the bike on the floor and the handlebar grips get damaged, there's still gonna be a plug on the end. But however, in your particular case, it does sound like the whole bar and the brake lever went straight into your leg and I'm not aware of anything that might really help with that. I mean, Ergon makes some grips that have got small sort of bar ends built onto them. They're more like a little stub that to stop your hand sliding off the end of the handlebars rather than an actual bar end. I guess that might help spread the load a bit, but I'm not really aware of anything other than the obvious, getting decent plastic um, plugs on the inside of your bar and then a handlebar grip that's got a proper end on there as well. I guess it could be easier to damage your leg if it's a sharper end, let's just say one of the lock-on style grips has got an aluminium collar, that's gonna be quite a hard surface. So something like a, uh, the 50 to one grips have got a rubber end with just a standard end cap, that perhaps might work out better for you. Um, if anyone's got any suggestions, let us know because I've not actually had to think about this before other than just the obvious plastic bar end plugs in there. But seriously, everyone take note of this because if you're running a bike without bar end plugs, you've only got to think that that's basically a cookie cutter. It's a core sampler waiting to happen. So I urge all of you to get some bar end plugs in there. And if you've got any help for Ryan, any comments you can add, um, we're gonna put this one as a sticky comment at the top of the comments below this video. So make sure you chip in there and let him know if there's any sort of armor that might protect his inside legs or any other cool safety tips that anyone has. Cheers guys. There we go, there's another Q&A GMBN tech session in the bag there. Hopefully you've had some of your questions answered and if not get them in in the comments below and the email address on screen at the beginning of the show for a couple more great videos click down here if you want to learn how to set up a suspension fork as part of our essential series and you'll be able to click through to some of the other videos in that series there too and click down here if you want to learn about the new specialized levo this thing is so sick it's ridiculous and yeah i know it's an e-bike and i just said it's a really cool e-bike you got to watch that one it's amazing and that's over on embn as always, click on the round globe to subscribe to the channel and help us get to 100,000K. And if you like GMBN Tech, give us a thumbs up.